What's it been like then? Has it thrown up a lot of opportunities, as one would suspect, given that a crisis always or nearly always presents an opportunity? Well, thank you, uh, Richard, uh, Yvonne and David. Great to be here. Uh, I hope you and your viewers are all keeping well and staying safe. Uh, you know, to your question, uh, we see significant opportunity for private equity across the region. Uh, to provide you with some context, uh, Asia represents approximately 30 percent of the global economy and nearly 50 percent of global growth. Uh, in 2020 alone, the region saw a GDP of about $25 trillion. As the capital markets continue to expand and evolve over here, we see increasing needs from really high quality companies to tap into sophisticated pools of private capital, both equity as well as debt. So all told, we expect to remain very busy in the region, which we see as an attractive destination for capital as well as a source of capital. Uh, Vikram, I, I want to get a sense of, you know, how you can add a value. Often private equity groups are seeing as as asset strippers and ones which essentially whittle down companies and then put them on the market for a nice tidy profit. But you say that you're creating value and you're creating opportunities and you're there for good in some ways. Give us a sense of what, where you're coming from. Sure. So, you know, to your question, uh, traditionally there have been three broad ways for private equity to create value. These include financial leverage, multiple expansion and operational improvements. In the world that we live in, and consistent with Carlyle's philosophy, you know, we're, we're faced with a situation where we have low interest rates, high valuations, and global growth. We really need to focus on helping our portfolio companies grow. So how do we do this? We focus on the operational efficiencies that enable our companies to expand and grow their top line revenues through our global network, benefit from cost efficiencies, and thereby expand their profit margins. I wanted to get then your thoughts on, since we're talking valuations here, David here, by the way, you know, I mean, not that the public and private markets move exactly in lockstep one to one, but typically when you do see, you know, parts of the public market, particularly tech and growth, see a step back in terms of valuations. We've seen that, of course, in some parts of the Asian equity market. Uh, that tends to have an effect on valuations further down into the private markets. I just want to get your views uh, on, on where you think valuations are right now in the private equity space, particularly those closer, uh, much closer to exits? Sure. Uh, you know, that's a key question and something we think about uh, a lot at Carlisle. Uh, I guess the first thing to say is it's worth mentioning that we maintain a long-term view uh, on our investment activity, both globally as well mm. as here in Asia. So it's not like we're worried about what's going to happen on a day-to-day -day basis as much as, you know, trying to find right. good companies at reasonable valuations where we can really contribute our expertise and help them grow, again, with operational efficiencies. So what's important to us is we find the right sectors, the right industries, and the kind of things that we really like in Asia are, are things like technology and business services, healthcare, as well as consumer media and retail. You know, as the long-term trajectory is one which is favorable and continues to grow, you know, that's what we really want to focus on. We believe it's going to create opportunity for all of us, and that includes your industry and the media sector as well. Vikram, you mentioned about technology. I'm not going to ask you about the politics regarding this regulatory crackdown in China, but what is your overall risk tolerance for tech now? Sure. Well, technology is a space that Carla has been pretty active in historically. We continue to maintain an active portfolio uh, globally and uh, also here in Asia. Uh, we do like technology. We, we pay close attention to a few things. Valuation, to the question which was asked earlier, is, is a key factor. But what we really want to do is find good companies, you know, which show potential for consistent growth. You know, we realize that you know, there might be ups and downs and, uh, you know, there, there might be times when there are certain disruptions in the public markets which might flow through to the technology aspects of the, uh, the private markets. But over time, we think uh, you know, this is a good space to be, and we uh, anticipate we'll continue to be active here. You know, we're active in technology in Asia. We have a sizable technology portfolio in America and in Europe as well. Tell us a little bit more about the dislocations that you're seeing uh, post-COVID uh, as we emerge out of this pandemic here. You mentioned there is a difference between liquidity and solvency. How is it different from what we saw back in the global financial crisis and, and currently how we are now? Sure, that's another key question, Yvonne, so thank you for asking that. Uh, you know, we were already seeing several trends pre-COVID that have only accelerated post-COVID. Uh, you know, these include things like low interest rates, high valuations, and global decoupling. Uh, we were also seeing strong trends in energy transition and technology disruption. So to your point, you know, one of the things we think about a lot at Carlyle is the difference between liquidity and solvency. Post-GFC, there were companies out there that were solvent but illiquid. 
uh, with the pandemic, there might be companies out there that are insolvent but liquid. So all told, you know, we really want to pay attention to the distinction between the real economy and the equity markets and the effect that the flood of liquidity can have on each of these. Time will tell how all of this unfolds. Uh, you know, our, our view is that companies and industries that embrace these shifts will benefit from the new paradigm, more so than those hoping to go back to an older version of normal. This is a central theme as to how we are going about allocating capital. As we like to say at Carlisle, the future has arrived early. That takes us into Southeast Asia. And when, when people think about the return to normal, it, 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 it's a bit murky, <clears throat> excuse me, compared to other parts of the world that are dealing with the virus and, you know, in much better vaccine rates, what have you. Millions are still unemployed outside of Singapore when you talk about the ASEAN region. Are, are you concerned about what that return to normal actually looks like? Because it seems like that's still a moving concept and a fluid target, if you will. Sure. So, you know, here in Southeast Asia, uh, where I'm based in Singapore, uh, you know, we, we see a certain amount of activity and return to normal, uh, as you put it. But that really varies from region to region and uh, specific geographies and countries uh, that have handled it uh, in, in different ways. So, you know, in Singapore, we're, we're gradually seeing, um, you know, with uh, some of the measures being lifted, uh, a return to office on a selective basis. Uh, we're seeing more uh, domestic activity, which will ultimately lead to domestic consumption. Uh, there's a fair amount of uh, spending power, which has been uh, uh, held captive over the last 18 months or so, and we see you know, some of that being released. Uh, but that's in a place like Singapore. I mean, if you look at uh, other parts of Southeast Asia, uh, including Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia, uh, they have uh, and the Philippines. Uh, they they all have different con uh, considerations. Uh, these pertain to the uh, uh, the healthcare uh, aspects of it. The uh, uh, the political aspects, and then ultimately, you know, how they want to go about uh, loosening restrictions and uh, get more integrated with the global economy. Vikram, with that in mind, how have things changed structurally? And give us an idea of who you're, you've been investing in of late, which perhaps dovetails into that structural shift. And who are you most excited about in terms of your investments? Sure. So, you know, the, the kind of companies that uh, we like, the sectors that we like, which I can talk about more thematically, uh, you know, remain in, uh, in technology and business services where we see a lot of activity. Healthcare, you know, we think will continue to be uh, an attractive space, particularly with what we've, ex we've all experienced uh, as a result of the pandemic. I think the need for uh, finding high quality uh, uh, companies and assets uh, in that space will be uh, uh, will remain prevalent. Uh, and then also, as you look at the growth aspect of the Asia region, uh, consumer, you know, that, that's an area that we think, uh, you know, long term uh, will continue to do very well, you know, with the, the size of the population, this, uh, uh, just the, the requirements of the uh, Asian consumer and, uh, you know, the ability for them to have more disposable income. So that, along with the, uh, media and retail, uh, we think will be uh, very good places to be over an extended period of time. 